Hi everyone, we are starting a new chapter and a new section all about derivatives. So we began studying derivatives at the end of last chapter and we found that a derivative is the instantaneous rate of change, which is the slope of the tangent line on a curve at any point. And in this section, we are going to begin developing some, some rules, if you will, or some shortcuts so that we don't have to do the long limit process every time we want to calculate a derivative. So I consider this the beginning of our derivative rules. So let's first take a look, a look at the derivative of a constant. So if C is a constant, then let's analyze this graphically. We'll do a little example. Let's say we were trying to determine the derivative of the constant three. So graphically, we know that that would represent the line y equals three, and y equals three is just a horizontal line. Therefore, the derivative, remember, of this function is the slope of this curve at any point. And this curve has a slope of zero everywhere. Therefore, the derivative of the constant three will just be zero. And we can generalize this and say that the derivative of any constant is going to just be zero because a constant function is a horizontal line with a slope of zero. Look at our second function, the derivative of x. So again, let's think graphically. If we analyze the function, our function is y equals x, and that's just going to be a line with a y-intercept of zero, zero, and a slope of positive one. So if I go ahead and graph the line y equals x, and now let's think about the slope of this line. Since this is linear, the slope remains the same everywhere. We have that constant rate of change, and the slope of this line is always one. Therefore, the derivative of x will just be one. So these are two kind of derivative rules that we can figure out graphically, but now we can apply them in the future. Anytime we take the derivative of a constant, it will be zero. And anytime we take the derivative of x, it will be one. Next, we're gonna look at the power rule. Now to develop the power rule, we're going to actually do the, the formal proof. We're going to use that formal definition of derivative, which was the limit definition that we developed in the last chapter. So let's begin by letting our function f of x be x raised to the power of n. Now, going back to our formal definition of derivative, and this is the limit definition of the derivative, let's write what that will be for this particular function. So that formal limit definition says that the derivative of a function, f prime, can be found by computing the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. That's the limit of the difference quotient. But let's go ahead and evaluate that for our particular function here, our function which is x raised to the n power. So that becomes the limit as h approaches zero of, instead of f of x plus h, when we use the function x raised to the n power, that will be x plus h to the n power minus that function x to the n power, all divided by h. Now, in evaluating this limit, we see that we clearly cannot do direct substitution, so we need to do a little bit of algebra. So I'm gonna pause here and take you through the process of thinking about expanding this quantity x plus h raised to the nth power. And this is work that you really don't need to put here as part of the proof. If you wanted to write it down on a separate sheet of paper, you could, a scratch sheet of paper, but I'm not actually gonna have you put it right here in the, in the notes. I'm gonna scoot kind of off to the side a bit here for some scratch space for me. And I just want us to think about what happens when we take a binomial, in this case, x plus h, and we raise it to a power. So I'm going to just start with a power of 1. x plus h to the first power is simply x plus h. 
Then if we take x plus h and we raise it to the second power, we know that will be x plus h times x plus h. And if you actually distribute that out, you'll have x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And those uh, two clearly are ones you probably can just do in your head. However, when we start to raise it to a higher power, then it requires us to do some more distributing. And rather than putting all that work here, I'm just going to write out the final answer. This would turn into x raised to the third power plus 3x to the second power times h plus 3x times h squared plus h cubed. And again, I didn't show my work for that, but if you had taken x plus h times x plus h times x plus h and done that three times carefully, you would have ended up with that expansion. Let me do one more. x plus h raised to the fourth power, if you distributed that binomial, you would end up with x to the fourth power plus 4x to the third power times h plus 6x to the second power times h squared plus 4x h to the third power plus h to the fourth power. And this is called doing a binomial expansion. And perhaps you learned something about Pascal's triangle. If that's something that rings a bell from your past, you certainly can use Pascal's triangle to help you with an expansion like this. But I'm just showing it so you can start to see the patterns that come through when we're taking a quantity, a binomial, and raising it to a power. So the first thing I want you to notice is that the very first term in this case, x to the fourth power, that first term is the first term in the binomial raised to the power. So when we did x plus h cubed, the first term was x to the third power. And you'll notice that also corresponds with the last term. The last term is h raised to the power that we are raising it to. So in our binomial expansion that we're going to do in this proof, in the proof we're trying to do x plus h to the n power, so we're basically saying if we were to do this expansion, our first term would be x to the n power, and we know the last term would be h to the n power. Now let's move on and look at the second term. The second term in the expansion, you'll notice that the coefficient happens to match the original exponent. Look at the second term in the previous one. The coefficient was a 3, and that matched the original exponent that we were raising the x plus h to. And then we have the x term next, and you'll notice that the exponent decreased by 1. And then we have an h, and the h is raised to the first power. So going to our expansion here then, our coefficient will be the original exponent, and the original exponent was n. Then we have x raised to 1 power less, so that would be n minus 1. And then we get that h that's raised to the first power. So my second term would be n times x raised to the n minus 1 power times h. Now for these, these next terms, I'm not actually going to write out any formulas for those. I'm just going to kind of write dot 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 because <laughs> we're going to have a bunch of terms depending on what the original exponent is. But you certainly can look at the second to last term. So let's do that one next. If I look at this second to last term here, we can identify some, uh, some patterns. Again, notice the coefficient here was a 4, and that was the original exponent. If I look at the previous one, the second to last term also has a coefficient of 3, which was the original exponent. Then we have x raised to the first power, and then we have h raised to the second power. And again, that was one power less than the original exponent. Look at the next computation down. We have x to the first power, and this time we have h to the third power, which again was one power less than that original exponent. So if we try to generalize here, we're going to still have a coefficient, which was the original exponent, so that would be n. Then we're going to have x raised to the first power, and then we'll have h raised to one power less than the original. So that would be n minus 1.
and that's going to be the second to last term in this expansion. So we're just focusing on the first term and the second term, and then the second to last term and the last term. And looking at what would that look like when I raise x plus h to a power. So let's take that information and go back to our proof and we can put that in here. So continuing on, we've got the limit as h approaches zero. And now let's take that expansion that we just did. We said that this x plus h to the nth power, the first term would be x raised to the nth power. The second term would have a coefficient of n then the exponent would be one less for x, and then we would gain the h, really it's h to the first power, and then there will be some additional terms in here, so I'll just say dot, dot, dot. Then my second to last term will also have a coefficient of n. It will have x raised to the first power, and then h raised to the n minus one power. And then the very last term in that expansion will be h raised to the n power. So that's what our basic expansion is going to look like for x plus h raised to any power. Now the rest of the numerator, I've got minus x raised to the n, all divided by h. Now let's check out the algebra here. Is there anything we can combine? And hopefully you can see that we have an x to the n that will subtract out with this x to the n. So the first and the last will subtract out. Now look at what remains. Every single term here, this has an h in it. The second to last term has an h in it. The last term has an h. And indeed, every middle term here, even though we didn't list them, every one of those terms would have an h in it. So we can essentially factor out an h from all remaining terms. So that will give us the limit as h approaches 0. I'm going to factor out an h from all of these terms that I have in the numerator, which is going to be a great thing because then if I can factor out the h, I'll be able to divide out the h that's in the denominator. So let's factor out an h. We'll be left with n times x raised to the n minus 1 power. Then I'm just going to write dot, dot, dot for all of these terms in between here that would all have an h in them. Then looking at this second to last term, this n times x raised to the n, excuse me, n times x times h raised to the n minus 1. If you factor out an h from that, you'll end up with n times x times h raised to the n minus 2 power. And then the very last term, which is h raised to the n power, if we factor out an h from that, we'll end up with h raised to the n minus 1, one power less, since we're factoring out an h. So we can now divide out these h terms, and now we're to a place where we can evaluate the limit. The limit as h approaches 0, we have n times x raised to the n minus 1, then we have a bunch of terms here in the dot, 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 and they all contain an h plus n times x times h to the n minus 2 plus h to the n minus 1. Whew, I know that's a lot. But direct substitution is ultimately the goal, and we're now to a place where we can do direct substitution. Look at all the terms that contain an h. The last term has an h. The second to last term has an h, and every term here that we didn't write that would be in the dot, dot, dot space, every one of those terms will have an h. So when you do direct substitution, all of these terms are going to become zero. You're going to essentially just be left with this first term. This was the only term that did not contain an h. So we're left with n times x raised to the n minus 1 power, and this is the power rule. This is what allows us to take the derivative of a function in the form of x raised to the power of n. And we kind of developed this earlier. We see that the coefficient is the original exponent, and then we subtract one from the exponent to get the derivative. So at the top, let's fill in our power rule. The derivative of x to the n power will be n times x 
raised to the n minus one power. We're gonna use this rule a ton. Let me do just a quick example, just so you can see it in action, even though we'll be doing more examples later. If I were to ask you for the derivative of x to the fourth power, now, rather than doing the limit definition, the formal definition of derivative, we can use this nice rule for the power rule. So the exponent becomes my coefficient, so the four comes in front, and then we will subtract one from the power. So the derivative of x to the fourth is simply four x to the third power. Awesome, moving on to our last three. We have the derivative of a constant times a function, and this ends up being a constant multiple, exactly like what we did with limits. So the derivative of a constant times a function will be the same as bringing the constant out in front and then multiplying that constant by the derivative of the function. So that's a constant multiple law, exactly what we did with limits. And the same is true for number five when we're adding or subtracting two functions. We can actually separate those and compute the derivatives alone and then add the results. So the derivative of f of x plus the derivative of g of x will be the same thing. And that works for subtraction as well. So I'll just put a little minus sign under there so you don't have to write it twice. That's uh, the, sum, the sum rule as well as the difference rule, but for derivatives here. And then number six, the derivative of e to the x. Now I'm going to make a second video and actually show you some calculator keystrokes to graph the derivative and see this. But rather than doing the formal proof here, we're going to see in just a second in my next video that the derivative of e to the x is actually just e to the x. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, but now let's go to our next video and I'll show you the calculator keystrokes to uh, solidify why the derivative of e to the x is e to the x.